Welcome to my session today on online surgery clinics. Today's lecture 20, carcinoma of the pancreas. Eh? Now, carcinoma of the pancreas is a very important uh, cause of obstructive jaundice, which we discussed in the last lecture. So this is a follow-up of this. Last lecture, we talked about cholidocolithiasis, which is the most common cause. Carcinoma of the pancreas is another important cause of obstructive jaundice. I shall briefly go through the disease, its uh, pre clinical presentation, investigations, and the principles of management of this uh, important uh, condition. I shall now present a short case history of a patient with obstructive jaundice. Okay, the patient, Mr. Tay, is a 72-year-old man who presents with a two-month history of generalized weakness and loss of appetite. And this was associated with yellow discoloration of the skin for the last one week. About three weeks previously, he noticed his urine became dark and one week before presenting to the hospital, his wife noticed yellow discoloration of his eyes and skin. He also noticed a vague discomfort in the lower epigastric region which was accompanied by easy satiety. He felt nauseated but no is vomiting. However, he had lost 6 kg in body weight in the last 2 months. He is a known hypertensive and diabetic for over 10 years and is on oral medication. He is also a known case of GERD and duodenal ulcer confirmed by OGDS 2 years ago. H. pylori done was positive and he was treated appropriately by his physician. He had been a heavy smoker but gave up 10 years ago. He consumes two bottles of wine per week for the past five years. He has no other significant comorbidities and there's no family history of similar illness but, but his father died of colon cancer when he was 68 years of age and his mother had breast cancer from which she died 20 years ago. His three siblings do not have any major medical illness other than diabetes and they are all on treatment. On examination, he appears emaciated and unwell. He was slightly dehydrated, thin and deeply jaundiced and slightly pale. The blood pressure was 145 over 84 millimeters of mercury, pulse 85 per minute and the temperature was normal 37.2 degrees Celsius. Abdominal examination reveals no distension or tenderness. The firm edge of the liver was palpable 3 cm below the right costal margin with the upper border of the liver at the 6th intercostal space. A tense cystic mass which moves on respiration is palpable in the right hypochondrium below the costal margin. It is non-tender and mobile. The cervical lymph no cervical lymphadenitis and there is no evidence of ascites. The spleen and kidneys were not palpable. So in summary, the patient, 72-year-old man with a two-month history of generalized weakness and appetite and jaundice for one week. No, uh, there is also significant weight loss. In our examination, he was cachectic, unwell, slightly dehydrated, thin and obviously jaundice. He was not in pain. The liver and gallbladder were enlarged but non-tender. There was no ascites. So with this clinical summary, we come to a diagnosis of provisional diagnosis of cancer carcinoma head of pancreas and differential diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma, peri ampullary carcinoma, advanced hepatoma, advanced gallbladder cancer and metastasis, secondary metastasis to the limb nodes of the uh, abdomen. Okay, now let's proceed with the lecture proper on carcinoma of the pancreas. First, briefly, the anatomy of the pancreas. The pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ which is located anterior to the second lumbar vertebra. It consists of a head, 
body and tail and it weighs around 80 grams. The head constitutes 30% of the mass of the gland and the body and tail the remaining 70%. It consists of exocrine and endocrine glands and 80 to 90% of the gland consists of exocrine tissue. The exocrine mass of the pancreas originates in the glands known as the acini which drain into the ductules, the intralobular ducts, the interlobular ducts and finally this will all drain into the main pancreatic duct as shown here. This is the main pancreatic duct. Okay, in this slide, you see the anatomy of the pancreas in relationship to the other organs. Huh? So you see, this is the pancreas, it consists of a head, body and tail. The head fits in slightly, uh, nicely into the C shape of the duodenum, whereas the tail extends across the uh, vertebral body to the left side to abut onto the hilum of the spleen. Okay, and uh, Okay, here again it shows the same thing, head of the pancreas, body and tail. And uh, the 65% uh, of the tumors occur in the head of the pancreas, whereas 15% uh, occur in the body and tail. And the rest occur diffusely scattered all over the pancreas. Okay, so these are the distribution of the tumors. The incidence of the tumor, general incident, overall incidence is 5.5 per 100,000 in men and 4 per 100,000 in women. Coming to carcinoma of the pancreas, carcinoma of the pancreas are two major types, eh? exocrine cells which occupy more than 90% of the tumors and from neuroendocrine, less than 10%. Okay, the large uh, percentage of exocrine tumors which arises from the SNR cells are the malignant ductal carcinomas, okay, which account for about 85% of all exocrine functions, uh, uh, tumors. Uh. And these ductal adenocarcinomas mainly arise in the head of the pancreas. They are solid, fibrous, and with dense fibrosis, difficult to differentiate from chronic pancreatitis, at times needing biopsy, and they tend to infiltrate locally along the nerve sheath via the lymphatics and blood vessels. They usually originate in uh, very tiny lesions known as the pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia, which is equivalent to the pancreatic carcinoma in situ. Liver and peritoneal metastasis by these tumors are common. The other import, other less important or rare tumors, malignant tumors, include the serous or mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma and the intraductal mucinous papillary tumor. Among the benign tumors, the important ones are the adenomas, huh? the serous and the mucinous cyst adenomas, of which the mucinous cyst adenomas may have malignant potential. There are also the neuroendocrine tumors which arise from the neuroendocrine cells which are very rare, less than, very much less than 10% and some of them include the insulinomas, glucagonoma, somestatinoma and VIPoma. Okay, this slide shows you the pathogenesis of carcinoma of the pancreas. The top slide here, it is increasing dysplasia of the cells here. This is a normal pancreas with the SNR cells. The cells are normal. Huh? Here the cells are normal. And then it undergoes a few uh, steps in the development of the cancer. Where it's increasing dysplasia as it goes or to the right. Okay, here you have got your uh, pain in 1, pain in 2, and pain in 3, which are uh, increasingly more severe forms of carcinoma in situ. Pain in means, pain in means uh, pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia, which is equivalent to the carcinoma in situ. And finally, it 
develops into frankly invasive carcinoma. And in this process, there are a lot of factors, uh, risk factors that act on these cells to convert it from normal to invasive cancer. And also there are a number of oncogene pathways that occur, among which the most important is your uh, CRAS, uh, K-R-A-S, or CRAS oncogene. Then you also have the CDKN2A and the other oncogenes here. So these oncogenes, okay, in their own pathways, uh, ca cause a mutation of the gene to lead to the conversion of a normal cell into a invasive ductal carcinoma of the pancreas. Here is the histological features. This is the normal duct lined by norm, a single layer of acina cells. Then this is penin 1a, penin 1b, penin uh, 2, penin 3, and then frank, uh, frank cancer here. Okay, now we come to the risk factors for carcinoma of the pancreas. Eh? Age is a very important risk factor. The peak incidence is 65 to 75 years of age. Males are uh, more affected than the females, ratio of 2 is to 1. And tobacco smoking is a very important risk factor for carcinoma of the pancreas. Others include family history, hereditary pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, which also, on the long term, predisposes to the development of uh, carcinoma of the pancreas. The others include hereditary polyposis uh, colorectal cancer, ataxic or ataxia telangiectasia, putz jugger syndrome, familial adiposis, uh, adenomatous polyposis, and diabetes mellitus. Now, what are the clinical presentations of carcinoma of the pancreas? Okay, the, the clinical picture depends on the site of the tumor. Okay, it can be one when the tumor involves the ampulla or the pancreatic head. Or the second group is when the tumor involves the carcinoma of the body or tail of the pancreas. In the first group, the ampullary or the pancreatic head carcinoma, the patients present with painless obstructive jaundice, eh? progressively painless obstructive jaundice, pruritus, dark urine, pale stools, malabsorption and statoria, nausea, epigastric pain or discomfort, and definite evidence of loss of weight, hepatomegaly, and a palpable gallbladder. Okay, so here tells you this is the pancreatic head tumor here. Okay, this tumor causes obstruction of the uh, lower end of the bile duct, causing all these features. Okay, the enlarged gallbladder is the basis of the coviceous law that we get in patients with such lesions. The second group of tumors will be the carcinoma of the body and tail. Patient has got vague discomfort, anorexia, weight loss, chronic back pain, epigastric discomfort with recent onset of diabetes in patients above 40 years of age, unexplained pancreatitis or unexplained acute pancreatitis, advanced cases with enlarged workhouse node and ascites, abdominal and pelvic metastasis. Another important feature is a un any unexplained weight loss, you must consider carcinoma of the body and tail of the pancreas. The second group of tumors which involve the body of the pancreas or the tail of the pancreas. So in these patients, the jaundice is not a main feature, but they have vague complaint of upper abdominal discomfort anorexia, weight loss, and they may also have chronic backache, pain over the back, which is very severe, can be severe, and not relieved by normal analgesics. They can have epigastric discomfort as the tumor grows in size, and the development of recent diabetes in patients 
especially above T years old, 40 years old. They can have unexplained pancreatitis. And in advanced cases, they can present with enlarged workout nodes, ascites, abdominal or pelvic metastasis. Unexplained weight loss in patients with tumors of the body and tail of pancreas is another common presentation which must not be forgotten. Any patient with unexplained weight loss, a diagnosis of cancer pancreas must be considered. Okay, this slide shows you some of the uh, physical signs that are associated that are seen in patients with calcinoma head of pancreas. Okay, here he has got a very grossly jaundiced patient and uh, emaciated face, the recent loss of weight, and also you see grossly jaundiced eyes and the skin. Here, there is a, this patient has got a large mass in the right subcostal region in the region of the, in the area of the gallbladder. So this is an enlarged gallbladder which is a common feature in a patient with carcinoma head of pancreas. Okay, this is in keeping with the covaceous law that you are all familiar with. Again, some features here, jaundice patient, grossly jaundice. Then here again, the eyes can see here that the sclera is yellow. And this is a patient, this jaundice patient, who is emaciated. Okay, you can see there's a loss of muscle and the patient is looks sick, huh? sick looking. And here, some of the common symptoms, jaundice, yellowness of the eyes and skin, uh, weight loss. Then the patient may have an onset type 2 diabetes mellitus, which may be an accompaniment of uh, CA pancreas. Upper abdominal pain, which radiates to the back. Okay, usually in the region of the epigastric or umbilical region, then it radiates to the back. And patient may have diarrhea due to malabsorption. Eh? Statoria, this can lead to loss of uh, fluid in the stools and leading to diarrhea. Here, all the signs and symptoms of pancreatic cancer, jaundice, nausea and vomiting, greasy light colored stools that float, okay, due to statoria back and and or stomach pain okay back pain epigastric pain is uh, diabetes presence of diabetes weight loss poor appetite dark urine due to the uh, bilirubinuria con uh, conjugated bilirubin in the urine itchy skin due to uh, obstructive jaundice and is uh, blood clots or bleeding tendency due to the jaundice where the lack of vitamin K. Okay, now what are the differential diagnoses? Eh? With all these symptoms and signs, what are the possible diagnoses of this patient? Pro eh? The provisional diagnosis we have got is a CA head of pancreas. The differentials will be cholangiocarcinoma, periampillary carcinoma, which consists of uh, carcinoma of the periampillary duodenum, duodenal mucosa, or the ca carcinoma of the ampulla of water. Cholidocolitis, chronic pancreatitis. Huh? So these are some of the common differential diagnoses which are mimic carcinoma head of pancreas. Okay. What are the investigations for carcinoma of the pancreas? Okay, blood tests, eh? especially if the patient has obstructive jaundice, urine and blood test, liver function test, looking for confirmation of the obstructive jaundice. The prothrombin time, which may be prolonged in obstructive jaundice patients. And very important is to do a CA199, okay, which may be elevated in carcinoma of pancreas. Next, we come to ultrasound scan of the abdomen, mainly to look for dilated biliary tree, gallstones, and mass lesion in the pancreas. Next, come to contrast enhanced CT scan of the abdomen, which is one of the best methods 
of imaging for carcinoma of the pancreas. It is also helpful in staging and determining the resectability of the tumor. Next is the ERCP or the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreaticogram, which is gives you a we determine the the status of the biliary ducts as well as use brush brush cytology or biopsy in cases of amplary tumors. And lastly, you have the endoscopic ultrasound, which is transurinal or transgastric ultrasound with FNAC. Okay, under this ultrasound guidance, okay, where you have a closer look of the head of the pancreas and biopsies can be taken through this method. Okay, now we come to the investigations for carcinoma of the pancreas. Okay, this can be classified into routine investigations. Okay, and this again can be either blood investigations or uh, imaging investigations. Huh? Among the blood investigations, you have the full blood count, complete blood count, looking for leukocytosis, serum amylase levels, the renal function test, and urine analysis. The very important test of liver function test is very, very important for a patient with uh, liver cancer. Eh? And of particular importance will be the bilirubin level, the conjugated and unconjugated levels, the alkaline phosphatase, and the GGT. Others include the liver enzymes AST and ALT and albumin. Coagulation profile is another important uh, investigation that must be done in all patients with jaundice. Actually, they can be prone to bleeding tendency. Among the image, uh, imaging investigations, the initial and the most important preliminary investigation is an ultrasound scan of the abdomen, which will be able to pick up uh, gallstones, stones in the CBD, dilatation of the CBD, or masses in the pancreas. This will be followed up with a CT scan, which is especially important for mass lesions, which can also be used as a CT scan guided percutane, uh, percutaneous biopsy of the lesions, as well as for staging of confirmed lesions. Next will be a MRCP, which is an MRI investigation, look for the status of the pancreas and the biliary ducts. And another important investigation being done these days is your EUS, uh, endoscopic ultrasound, which uh, gives you a closer look of the head of the pancreas, where FNAC or biopsy can be done to ascertain the diagnosis. And finally, the ERCP, which is an important investigation, not only for diagnosis, but for therapeutic as well in certain uh, group of patients. These four uh, investigations indicated by the asterisk are the ones that must be done, uh, very important investigations. Okay, liver function test is a special, uh, particular importance and it's very important to do the albumin, total bilirubin is usually raised. Okay. Uh, Conjugated and unconjugated. Okay, the conjugated is usually more than double the con unconjugated value. Okay, as shown in this case here. The liver enzymes are usually normal. However, alkaline phosphatase is markedly elevated. So these are features of obstructive jaundice, which is a feature of uh, carcinoma head of pancreas. So the impression from this will give a conclusion that in carcinoma head of pancreas, there is obstructive jaundice. And this obstructive jaundice is confirmed by the bilirubin. However, there is satisfactory liver function, which is confirmed by this normal uh, levels or minimally elevated liver enzymes. Okay. These are some of the features uh, of the investigations. This is an ultrasound. It shows you a dilated uh, or distended gallbladder. You yeah, can see here there are no stones here. Gallbladder is distended, but no stones. Huh? And this is a CT scan. It shows you a mass huh, in the head of the pancreas here. 
Okay, mass in the head of the pancreas. Then this is a uh, endoscope uh, EUS endoscopic ultrasound. Okay, these are all images of uh, endoscopic ultrasound. Okay, this is a dilated uh, CBD. Okay, and probably the stones here, and it may also be a mass in the head of the pancreas. Okay, here the, through the endoscope you can see a protruding uh, mass the head of the pancreas, which can be seen protruding into the duodenum. Here, another mass here. Okay, another mass in the head of the pancreas and dilated CBD. Okay, these are all endoscopic ultrasound pictures. Okay. And these are ERCP and MRCP images. This is ERCP, you can see. There's a big mass here and causing narrowing, uh, stenosis of the lower end of the CBD. Here again, there's a mass here causing obstruction and proximal dilatation of the, gross dilatation of the CBD. Okay, this is a picture of a MRCP film. Gallbladder is normal and possibly there's obstruction here. Okay. Then coming to the staging of uh, pancreatic carcinoma is normally using the TNM classification and it is usually done by CT scan eh, with the aid of CT scan or nowadays maybe even the PT PET scan. Okay, they can be classified into T1, 1A, 1B, 1C according to the size of the tumor. Okay, and T1 is usually less than 2 centimeters, 1A, 1B and 1C as the measurements that are given here. T2, more than 2 centimeters, but less than 4 centimeters, huh? the size of the lump in the head of the pancreas. T3 is more than 4 centimeters. Huh? All right. And end status, are quite simple. No lymph nodes involved. Here, a few lymph nodes involved, 1 to 3 lymph nodes, and uh, one to three groups of lymph nodes and N2 more than four lymph nodes. Okay, four more than four, one less than three. Okay, this according to N1 and N2. Come to pancreatic cancer staging. The T staging where the tumor is involved is T1 or T2. Okay, in T1 tumor is when the size is less than two centimeters and T2 tumor is when the size is more than two centimeters. Two centimeters. In T1 and T2, the tumor is confined to the pancreas. T3 is when the tumor invades the adjacent structures, okay, local invasion. This includes infiltrating into the duodenum, infiltration into the left spleen, and infiltration to the left suprarenal gland, and also infiltration into the splenic vein or the superior mesenteric and portal vein. So all these comes under T3, invasion into adjacent structures. T4 is when there is distant metastasis and also when there is encasement, very particularly important for pancreatic cancer is encasement of the superior mesenteric artery and the ciliar artery yeah, as in case here. Okay, The tumor infiltrates into the superior mesenteric artery here or into the Cilia axis, huh? cilia artery here. Once you've got the staging of the disease done, then you look for the resectability criteria. Now, what are these criteria? And this criteria, so-called the resectability criteria, can be assessed by dividing the patient's stage into four categories, huh? stage one to four. Stage one is obviously resectable. When the tumor is T1, T2, and N0, and M0. That means there's no extra, extra pancreatic disease, no encasement of the cilia axis or the SMA. So it is resectable. Stage 4, on the other hand, is unresectable because despite any T, any N stage, but M is 1. That means there is metastasis, liver, peritoneal, or lung metastasis. Once M is 1, then it is clearly unresectable. When you come to stage 2, which is typically resectable, the tumor can be T1 or T2, 
N1 and N0. M0. At the same time, it can be either T3, N1, N2 or M0. So M is 0, metastasis is negative, but the regional lymph nodes may be involved. However, despite the regional lymph nodes being involved, there's no encasement or involvement of the ciliar artery or the superior mesenteric artery. When these two arteries are not involved, then despite the tumor being uh, stage 2, it is resectable. Now come to T3, on the other hand, is unresectable because it is T4. And again, it can be have regional lymph nodes may be involved, but there is encasement of the CA and SMA. Okay, so in these patients, despite being T4 and the regional lymph nodes may or may not be involved, just because the arteries, arteries are encased, then it is unresectable. Okay, now we come to the prognosis of carcinoma of pancreas. Eh? There are two broad categories. Eh? One is, the first one is resectable tumors. Only 15% of the tumors are resectable by the time of presentation. And the second thing is 85% of these tumors are unresectable. Now, even among the 15% that is resectable, the post-operative mortality, eh, especially after a Whipple's procedure or a, a conservative resection of the pancreas, the post of morbidity is 30 to 40 percent, and this is usually due to post of bleeding, infection, and leakage from anastomosis between the pancreas and the bowel. The post-operative mortality is 3 to 5 percent after this procedure which are major procedures. And the overall five year survival rate after all this is seven to 25%. And in some centers, many centers is much higher than 25%. Compared to, for example, if it is an ampullary tumor, the five year survival rate after resection is 40%. And the post resection mean survival huh, after is 10 to 20 months. So it's not much. So you can see, even after surgery, the result is not very, the survival is not very good. But for the tumors that are 80%, 85% that are unresectable, they're either locally advanced, non-metastatic tumors, the meal survival rate is 6 to 10, uh, eight, uh, 10 months. Whereas for those metastatic disease, it's only 2 to 6 months. And uh, the tumors of the pancreas, uh, the body and tail, have poorer prognosis because of their late presentation. Whereas tumors on the head of the pancreas have a slightly better prognosis uh, because they present early uh, jaundice. Okay, the next type of treatment is adjuvant therapy. The One of the most important one is chemotherapy for the carcinoma of the pancreas adenocarcinoma and it is usually more for palliative huh? very rarely is curative and usually the drugs used are 5 fluorouracil or gemcitabine if the tumor is uh, is a lymphoma which is a rare form of pancreatic carcinoma the prognosis is slightly better the other forms of treatment includes radiotherapy target therapy and immunotherapy which are becoming increasingly more and more used these days Palliative treatment for unresected tumors can be uh, two types. One is during laparotomy. If there's CBD obstruction, you go for a bypass surgery, yeah? colidoco duodenostomy or a colidoco jejunostomy. The other simpler procedure is a cholecysto jejunostomy, where you bypass the obstruction by doing a bypass procedure. In the cholecysto jejunostomy, you bypass the jejunum to the gallbladder, thereby the flow of bile is uh, redirected uh, into the uh, 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 redirected to bypass the obstructed tumor. If it is duodenal obstruction, then you do a gastro jejunostomy. Yeah? These two, I will show you the diagrams a bit later. And other procedures or other forms of treatment include phosphatoria, treat the patient with enzyme supplements. Very good example is your creon. Treat the diabetes with either oral hypoglycemics. In fact, most of these patients may need insulin. 
And the other very important symptom is pain. Okay, intractable pain, eh? which can be treated with narcotic analgesics like morphine or opiates or uh, uh, doing nerve blocks eh? such as the abdominal splanchnic sympathetic block eh? to reduce the pain of the, for these patients. Okay, this last slide summarizes the surgery for carcinoma of the pancreas. There are two groups of patients, resectable, 15% of the patients, the tumor is resectable. So in these cases, you have got two main situations. One is carcinoma head of the pancreas, where a pylorus preserving pancreatoduronectomy or PPPD with lo local lymphadenectomy is the treatment of choice. The more widely used, more established uh, treatment is Whipple's operation, where you remove the gastric antrum together with the, the bile duct and pancreas. The second group of conditions, which are less, uh, fewer patients coming into this condition, is when the CA is involving the body or tail of the pancreas. So in these patients, the operation that is preferred is distal pancreatectomy. In the majority of cases, 85% uh, of cases, at diagnosis on admission is unresectable. The tumor is unresectable. So in these patients, they are, there are two operative procedures that can be done. First is when this uh, patient is uh, developed jaundice due to CBD obstruction by the tumor. So you can do an ERCP stenting or bypass procedures. The three common ones are colidoco duodenostomy, colidoco jejunostomy, and colicisto jejunostomy. The second group of patients, less uh, rarer condition, is when the con patient comes with duodenal obstruction by invasion of the tumor into the second part of the duodenum. And these causes can, this can be relieved with endoscopic stenting of the duodenum or doing a bypass gastrojejunostomy, whereby the, the duodenal obstruction is bypassed with the gastrojejunostomy. Okay, one of the most common operations done for curatic uh, pancreatic cancer is called Whipple's procedure, which is actually a pancreatoduodenectomy. Okay, it consists of three uh, resections. Okay, the duodenum and antrum here, duodenum and antrum, the common hepatic duct and the gallbladder, and the third is the resection of the pancreatic head. So these are the, this is known as the triple resection. And after resecting, there's a triple bypass to reconstruct this operation procedure. Okay. And this consists of first a colidoco jejunostomy, okay, common hepatic duct is joined to the jejunum. Secondly, a pancreatico jejunostomy, where the pancreas is joined to the resected part of the stomach, uh, uh, pancreas. And the third one is your gastro jejunostomy, stomach to jejunum. So it is before is the patient resection and after is your anastomosis. So it is a triple resection and triple bypass. Okay, in the pylorus preserving pancreatoduodenectomy or PPPD, the triple resection is still there. But instead of removing the whole stomach, the antrum and the pylorus are left behind. Therefore, the pyloric sphincter is preserved so as to present, prevent the reflux of duodenal gastric reflux. Okay, the triple bypass is also preserved. Okay, the first one here is the colidoco jejunostomy. Second one is the pancreato, uh, pancreato uh, jejunostomy. And the third one, instead of the gastro jejunostomy, what is done is a duodenal jejunostomy. This is to prevent the reflux of duodenal contents into the stomach because the pyloric sphincter is preserved. So the main difference is the gastrojejunostomy is replaced with a duodenojejunostomy to reduce the incidence of reflux. 
Okay, now we come to the non-resectable pancreatic cancers, huh? where only palliation is pos uh, possible. Huh? The first, the most commonly used palliative technique is stenting of the either the bile ducts or the duodenum, whichever is obstructed by the tumor. Okay, in the first case, which is more common, is the obstruction of the bile duct by a growth in the head of the pancreas here. Okay. So, there are two ways of stenting. One is known as the PTC or the percutaneous transhepatic cholangiographic method, eh, where a percutaneously uh, catheter or tube, fine tube, is inserted uh, into the ducts, eh, dilated intrahepatic ducts, and the common bile duct. And a stent is inserted through this tube where it passed and placed in the bile ducts. The second one is known as the, the endoscopic stenting, where the patient is done, uh, ERCP is done, where a scope is passed, and this scope is used to can, uh, insert a um, uh, stent into the lower end of the common bile duct. Okay, this is known as the endoscopic stenting. So both of these is the biliary stenting. Now, in case the duodenum is obstructed by the tumor and the patient develops obstructive symptoms, gastric outlet obstruction, then again you use an endoscope, the OGDS this time, to insert the stent in the narrow segment of the duodenum. And then this will be left there. And the, the good thing about these uh, new stents is that these stents are expandable. Thereby, once it's placed, it expands to dilate the duodenum or the bile duct wherever it is located. So there are three types, PTC, endoscopic ERCP stenting or endoscopic OGDS stenting. Stent these days are very advanced. They are usually made of plastic, metal or nowadays is made of mesh. And the good thing about this mesh is, as I said, is expandable. If it is left in place, it absorbs the tissue uh, fluids and it ex expands to enlarge the widen the lumen. Okay, next, we come to the surgical procedures for palliative uh, resection of pancreatic tumor. Okay, okay, again, you have bile duct obstruction and duodenal or pyloric obstruction. Okay, two scenarios for bile duct obstruction, you can either do a gastrojejunostomy. Okay, gastrojejunostomy, sorry, cholecystojejunostomy, or a colidoco, colidoco jejunostomy. Here you attach the core bladder to a loop of jejuna in cholecystojejunostomy, and in this colidoco jejunostomy, the bile duct is connected to your loop of jejuna. Okay, thereby by passing the bile duct. In duodenal or pyloric obstruction, you have got a tumor here which causes duodenal or pyloric obstruction. Therefore, the palliative surgery is gastrojejunostomy. What are the, the surgical surgery that is in summary? In summary, what is the surgery that is available in pancreatic cancers? If it is resectable, it's either a Whipple's operation or pyloric preserving pancreatoduodenectomy. Okay, either one. Nowadays, most people preserve the second. If it is unresectable, then depends on where the tumor is obstructing. If it is a CBD obstruction, which is the more common obstruction with, result, with resultant severe jaundice, then ERCP standing can be done. Okay. Or open colidoco duodenostomy, colidoco jejunostomy, or cholecysto jejunostomy. These two, these three procedures can be done either open surgery or laparoscopically. If the duodenum is obstructed, which is less common, then endoscopic stenting, stenting is the treatment of choice, as I mentioned just now. Feeling which you can do a gastrojejunostomy, thereby bypassing the duodenum.
Okay. Well, thank you for joining me for this session on carcinoma of the pancreas. I hope this short session would have been a great help for you to understand the topic much better. Still, I see you again in another session. Thank you.